I will talk to you about the file. This might sign model for IHO is in all assembly, and that's something that Andrea Frangi mentioned that will be the annex I in the new Eurocode 512. Uh, this is based on the research done by our PhD student, Katrin Nella Mager, uh, Taltec. Uh, and I will shortly present it. So, iChoice or DIN webbed member, as we call them also, <clears throat> uh, are highly optimized uh, wooden structures wooden members, as you see in the, in the picture here. So it might have flanges made of solid wood or LVL, uh, it had web, uh, structure made of OSB, fiberboards, plywood. And these kinds of structures are highly optimized. So highly optimized use of wood. Uh, these structures are very popular in the Nordic countries, in the UK, also in the US. Uh, and since now we didn't have a proper uh, fire design model for, for the structures. In the fire design, we have to consider we have to protect them, we have to consider the protection on the fire side and what happens when the protection falls. And actually, using this model, we can continue design, uh, we can predict what happens with the flange. We can also predict what happens with, with the web, but sometimes, of course, the scenario can be, be very fast. Uh, so that's why if we have st structures like that, highly optimized, then the design model should also be a little bit more complicated to take everything in, into account. Actually, in the Code 511, the general part, uh, we have the design models uh, for the thin flanged and thin webbed members in the chapter 11, as you see some cross sections in the picture. Uh, uh, here we have the beams, uh, but you can also have them and use them as a wall starts. Uh, for the fire design, there are unfortunately no good existing models. There is one option given in the guideline, fire safety in Libre buildings, and the European technical guideline, uh, where you can design some situations. You can design only the floor, floor elements. So it's not for walls and you can only use the model where you have the cavity insulation made of stone wood. Uh, so it is a, a model, but it's quite uh, limited. So we have done at uh, Taltec and by Katrin Nella Mager, mostly the PhD students, we have improved this model and widened the application uh, by some uh, extensive uh, research based on fire testing, based on thermal stimulations, will show something to you. Uh, but if you see the pictures here now, two, two different cross sections, the rectangular one and the eye choice. So we see that, uh, for example, the corner roundings, the two dimensional charring that happens on the fire side that affects the uh, rectangular cross section much less than uh, the eye choice, the corner roundings, the same effect, the same charring scenario for the that affects the flange has uh, has uh, much bigger, <clears throat> much more consequences. Uh, so we cannot deal it with, at the same way. The proposed design model for eye choice that considers the charring, of course, as Andrea already explained you. So we always have. To to see what happens with the charring, how much we lose over cross section of charring, but there is also important what happens with the mechanical resistance because of the heating below, behind uh, the char layer. And in this case, we can have different situations. So for floors, we have mostly bending, 
that is covering for walls, we have compression, but we also have to, con to consider the buckling. And you can imagine that for such small optimized structures with small dimensions, the buckling might be quite decisive case. For the charting, we use the same Europe code uh, or European charting model, uh, the same charting faces, same numbers. However, there is a little difference with the eye choice. And this is now because of this optimization. Uh, so it's the same with the no charring phase zero and the protected charring phase two. So this is happening behind uh, the fire protection, for example, a gypsum board. But then if the gypsum board falls off, uh, then for the eye choice, we have a, a short but fast phase three post protection phase. So short phase, one, two minutes only, where we have a very quick charring. And then we consider this consolidation time and we continue with a little bit uh, slower charring. But it's really important to, to predict this fast uh, charring phase and the charring depth occurring during this phase. And then what is uh, also important is the web and when the charring of the web starts. And here the, all the experiments and the thermal simulations and investigations show that uh, that more or less it's uh, 45 degrees from the corner, upper corner of the flange. If you take the line 45 degrees, this is the critical way for the heat to affect the web. So we have to know what, what materials are protecting our flange, what material is in, is in the cavity, and then we are able to calculate when the web starts to char. And if the thin web starts to char, then we don't have so much time left until the rupture. So it's really important to, to know and to predict as, uh, as much as possible, as uh, close as possible the time. Uh, so I will not go into details. It's the same European charring models. You can use the same uh, coefficients uh, to explain the charring rates, different phases, just uh, with different colors. I show the different charring phases here. So uh, that is all we, we have to consider from the fire exposed uh, side of the flange. And the same happens with the, uh, with the lateral side. And, and in the case of eye choice, the charring from the lateral side can also start with the uh, good installations before the gypsum or the, the other protection material falls off. So even for the PL1 insulations, if you remember the classification from Andreas uh, presentation. So he, even here, even in the, in the lateral charring, we have at least two phases, so behind the protection and after the protection falls off. So using these different coefficients, these different uh, scenario for charring, then we are able to predict what's, what is left of the flange after our required fire time, uh, what, how much we lose because of charring. And then if the web charts starts to char, then we have to take this also into account. And we have to calculate how much web is charring. But of course, this is the last stage and there we don't have so much uh, time left. If the web starts to char, the, the uh, fire resistance is quite close. Uh, but then <clears throat> we also have to consider the, what's, what's happening with, with the heat, uh, with the load bearing capacity and the uh, effect of heating behind the char layer. So the dark red zone here is the D0 layer that you also heard about uh, from Andrea. 
Uh, this is zero strength layer, so the compensating fictive layer we have to remove from the cross section uh, to compensate. And the effective cross section or the white part in the middle here is the one that is left that will carry our loads and that, that has uh, no reduced strength. So we count the original strength for this effective part of the flange. Uh, for the floors, there is another additional effect, uh, what is uh, adhesives in the finger joints. If the flange is, uh, is uh, jointed with the finger joints, you know, the adhesives for this are different. The heat heating behavior is different and sometimes we we can lose our finger joint it can open even before the flange starts to char just because of the high temperatures so this is also something that we didn't consider up to now and we have to consider when we are going to use the new euro code we always have to know which adhesive systems we use for the finger joints and we even calculate the D0 based on of the class of the adhesives used. And for this, you, you will also find the test method in the New York code. How to test adhesives, it's really, really simple, uh, small scale method. But the adhesives and the finger joints, they are relevant to only to floor structures, not, not for walls. Now I will come back to the walls. So with the, for this wall model, with uh, what happens with the wall and uh, the buckling, uh, so that is investigated with the test series in cold conditions and the fire tests, and also a lot of thermal simulations. And that's the, uh, the way it's usually done. So we, use, we do fire tests, calibrate uh, the properties based on the fire tests, and then using these properties, we can simulate the structures uh, using the thermomechanical simulations. In this program, we used, uh, we choose uh, different uh, sizes of flanges, different sizes of eye joists, so the heights, and we did some buckling condition, buckling uh, calculations under fire conditions uh, using these parameters and and uh, comparing and analyzing them. And then the final outcome was the D zero layers that uh, cover uh, all these selected cross sections. Uh, so what, what is considering charring, if we come back to charring, then this can be made in the so-called model scale fire tests. So this test scale can be quite small. So here you see the test specimen 1.5 times 1.5 meters dimensions. <clears throat> uh, the temperature is measured by the thermocouples. Uh, that also has some uh, rules you have to follow. The thermocouples has to stay in the same zone uh, of the all the zone of the same uh, temperature for at least uh, 30 millimeters and so on so you, you have to be sure that your measurements are right but all the charring scenarios can be measured in this scale or even a little bit smaller scale but what's considering the strength, the load bearing capacity, then it has to be a full scale fire test. So always to verify, to say something, to sense. then the small scale testing is not valid. So you see some coefficients for the charring model here. Uh, you see that they are much more complicated than for cross, uh, rectangular cross sections, but that's the case. That's because of the optimization we have to be very precise here. Every second, every millimeter is, is important for that kind of structures. And all the models have to be verified. So this charring model is verified by fire tests. 
and you see that uh, the calculated or the simulated uh, jarring is on the safe side, so it's less, or it's more than uh, than in the fire test and on the safe side, and that how it has to be. So now, if I come to the buckling behavior, <clears throat> then what we have done here is the two test areas in cold conditions, but uh, we did some changes in the flanges in the cross sections and in the load application so we for example here we we had uh, eye choice with uh, cross section height of 200 and 500 millimeters so like small ones and very high ones very slender ones and then we reduced the flanges uh, that's supposed to be on the fire side just by planing them out, just reducing the, the sizes differently. Uh, and then the one flange was uh, braced with the stiffening plates, and the load was in the middle in the centrical loading. So this was one test area. Also, we had uh, different flange uh, sizes 47 by 47 and 47 by 70 millimeters. And then we have done another test area with a variable location of the load. So the load was placed on the one st stiff flange, let's say, and on the, on the other flange that was not uh, braced, but also in the center, just to, to understand, to analyze uh, how is the load distribution between the flanges acting and what's happening with the, with the buckling behavior. Uh, so you see one uh, picture of the testing uh, here. And also here we had the different cross-section heights that we tested. And then of course the verification fire tests and ver verification uh, thermal simulations were done. Uh, so with the eye choice why this was needed <clears throat> is that if you now assume uh, that the fire is on the right side so in the beginning we have uh, both of the flanges uh, braced they are stiff they cannot buckle to the side in wall plane but in fire we can lose the, the first barrier here on the right side uh, and then <clears throat> The situation is, is uh, like in the picture here. So one flange is still braced, but the other flange is free. And that uh, makes the situation much weaker for this flange. Uh, the load distribution normally is done according to the areas and stiffness. So the, this flange will take more load than, than the small uh, burnt flange. Uh, for the stability out of wall plane in this direction, uh, it's pretty easy. You just have to, to find the new effective cross section, effective uh, moment of inertia for this, and, and you can just calculate as a whole cross section uh, for the stability out of wall plane, just as you do in the normal conditions. Uh, with the fire <coughs> properties for the fire situation if you have if you have to consider the stability in wall plane in that direction then actually the weakest part is the the weaker burned flange here and that should be then considered separately so we have we have to take only this flange and we have to take only this load that is going to this flange and this will be the decisive in this case. And as you see on the picture here, uh, what can happen is that this flanges chart, uh, the web is, uh, is also warm already. Uh, so you might have some uh, problem here. <clears throat> the web is 
is a little bit holding the flange. But actually what is happening with the buckling and how to calculate the lambda, for, for example, slenderness, uh, that is up to the web stiffness. So actually we have to know the, we have to calculate the spring coefficient for the web. And then we, based on that, we add like effective supports as bracings. So we can reduce the uh, buckling length based on the stiffness of the web. Uh, that is the, the meaning and the base for this uh, model and the, the backlink calculation part of it. Unbraced exposed flange is, is calculated based on the stiffness of the web. Of course, all the properties, the modulus of elasticity and the strength values are, are calculated according to the fire uh, design and for the fire design. So the modulus of elasticity is also smaller compared to the normal one. Uh, so these uh, these are the principles. We'll not go into details here. Uh, how to calculate the buckling, and then <clears throat> uh, we also need the d zero values. And as you see, the formula on the screen now is so the d zero for such a small optimized uh, eye choice flanges is also quite complicated, the equation is complicated, but that's again because of the optimization. And in this case, we don't use the constant T0 values from the beginning of fire to the end, uh, but the T0 value is uh, changing to somewhere there is a peak and then it will be lower again and you, you take it into account. You have to know the fall off time, you have to know the, uh, the uh, width of the flange. All these uh, kind of models have to be verified, as we say before. Uh, so this floor model is verified in the full-scale fire test. So here you have one picture of our laboratory in Trondheim, uh, where we make the loaded uh, full-scale fire test with eye choices. And again, you see that all the calculated fire resistances of these tested floors are on the safe side. And it has to be so. So if it's not so, then it's something wrong with the fire design model. So to conclude, uh, I think we have a good model now for the new Eura code uh, to design buildings with eye choice or to also for fire. And not only floors, but also walls. Uh, in this picture, you have the building process of uh, eight story uh, house in Sweden, North Sweden, when we use eye choice, also for walls. And this design model will be incorporated into Europe Code 512, and it is named as Annex I after I choice and the annex will be mandatory. So thank you for your attention.